So, today uh, I will talk about non orthogonal range searching and uh, let me just sort of to remind you, let me describe the range searching problem in abstract setting and then we will instantiate for some specific problems. So, just to remind you that uh, in abstract setting, you are given a set of points and you are given a set of ranges. So, here you have a set of points S and ranges are regions. Uh, earlier in the, in the class, when you learnt about orthogonal range searching, the regions were rectangles. So, that is what orthogonal range searching. So, if you have R is a set of rectangles, this was orthogonal range set of orthogonal rectangles or x is aligned rectangles range. So, that was uh, what you saw, you saw the k d trees and you saw range trees and I think you also saw some other data structures and you saw how you answer the queries efficiently by pre processing the point sets into a data structure. Now, we will go wilder and we will not restrict ourselves to orthogonal rectangles, but we will consider other regions. So, for example, we might consider uh, triangles, that is one possibility that regions are triangles or we may consider disks, that the set of points inside this disk or we may think about uh, what we call half planes. And you can think about other regions, you can there is something called semi algebraic uh, um, regions, you can think about the ellipses or parab uh, parabolas or uh, any other shape you can think about defined by some polynomials or some other functions one can talk about. Um, so, in general basically let me now sort of uh, say, so, you, so what you have is a, so, so R could be a set of triangles, disks, half planes etcetera. Uh, mostly I will talk about 2 D, but uh, tomorrow toward the end of the class I will talk about some, I will make some remarks about higher dimensions. So, the, uh, in, in formally speaking what we want to do is, we want to have a uh, some semi group. So, you have a let us say So, you think about you are given a semi group So, by semi group you have uh, some uh, set some set and you have a uh, some uh, plus operation the difference between a group and semi group is unlike group in semi group you do not have uh, a negation negation you do not have negative. So, inverse does not exist the group is when you have plus and minus both and semi group you have only plus operation there is no minus operation. So, for example, uh, traditional addition is semi group, but things like max, I give you set of numbers, you operator uh, plus operation could be the maximum, could be minimum, if you think of sets, union, intersection and so on. So, you can have different operations and this in general is called semi group. So, you are given a weight from sigma s sigma. And so, the question the, the problem will be pre process S into a data structure such that for a query region for a query range compute uh, my notation will become bad. So, let me change then my notation a little bit. Let me call it x. W p. 
okay. And to just give you some, so you have you have in the when you learned about orthogonal range searching, I assume you saw both range reporting and range counting at least that is basically you want to say let us say think about the range reporting let us say range counting first. Well that is a uh, I wrote as a binary operator that plus so that is why I wanted to differentiate between plus and sum. Uh, range uh, so uh, so this is a binary operator the plus that O plus that I wrote plus inside the O sign and this is uh, over a multiple applying multiple times. So, that is all. Uh, or if you do not like this one, you can as some deep uh, complaining one can use. So, so, range counting if you want to think about, then that is a kind of a simplest case, then x is nothing but uh, uh, natural numbers because you want to count. and plus is nothing but a, a standard plus and w of each basically w of uh, let us see let me write it simply because it is not a w of p is equal to 1 for all p in s all right. So, this is a very simplest case. Now, suppose if I want uh, so, so basically what you are sort of this complicated way of saying is that count the number of points inside the query region. Right. Now, suppose let me ask you the following question, I do not even care about the counting, just tell me that uh, whether there is any point inside the query region, emptiness query. So, what is called emptiness, yes return yes if uh, it is not empty. So, if I want to formulate this in the semi group way, how will I do it? Say it again. So, so, so x becomes a binary 0 or 1 and what, what is the operator? What is the dot? Yes, you want to do or operator. Yeah. So, so okay. Yeah. So, you so you do or. So when it is, uh, it will be written one if any point is inside. So basically, so x becomes binary zero one. Am I right? Now, more interesting is where the hell? How? How would? Oh, okay. Let's. Ah, yeah. So range reporting. So this is more interesting. So, how will I formulate range reporting in this uh, frame union? Okay, so, what is the first let us talk about what is the x? No, not the point itself because we think about what could be the domain because uh, uh, you are think, talking about the point the weight of a point is the point itself, but what should be the set x? No, no, no. So, no it uh, is not r square. So, this set x which is uh, should be defined the universe am I right. So, what are the possible uh, uh, elements in your uh, in output in some sense you should think about all the subsets am I right. So, this is x will be power set of s. So, basically the, when you report you are reporting a subset of the input point. So, it is all possible subsets and plus will be operator will be union and will be of a singleton right. So, that is a sort of a. So, this is an abstract framework that captures all the different versions of a range range searching problems. Now, also when you, so this is the basic abstract model. The second is what do we care about? We care about three things in the in the order. One is we care about query time, we care about the size of the data structure and P n which is the pre processing time. 
I assume you have seen all this stuff, but I am just uh, reminding you because, so that uh, you know what I am talking about. Now, for the orthogonal range search, when you saw, when you saw the KD trees, then if you use the space to be order of n, the query time was order of root n and here you allow n log n space, then you can do it in log n time, range counting let us say. Uh, so, this was orthogonal range searching. So, here it was not too hard that uh, when you allow only linear space, the query time was root n, but if you want to get query time to be roughly log n, you just have to blow up the size of the data structure by log n. Now, I should say that the size of the data structure has to be at least linear, because you have to store each point exact at least once, if you want to answer the queries exactly. And even the binary search or the finding successor of an item takes log n time. So, the query time will be at least log n. So, this will be this is a flow. So, question will be can I always achieve log n query time using almost linear space? Let us I do not care about log factors. So, the case of orthogonal range searching we were lucky, we could answer the uh, a query in log n time almost using linear space and log n space. Now, when we go to non orthogonal range searching, we would not be so lucky. If you use a linear space, the query time will be large. Of course, you, if you are willing to spend linear time, then it is trivial, just scan through all the points. So, the goal is that you want to answer a query in sub linear time, in less than linear time. Right? So, question is using linear space, how fast you can answer a query? That is one extreme. The other, other question you ask is, if you want to answer a query time in log n time, how much space I have to use. So, so the two end of the spectrums is that uh, q n is order of log n, what is the space, how fast you can do it or if I do, let me say, if s n is order of n, then how much time you will need. So, those are that and you want to have a trade off and then you ask, ask the question can I then combine these two to get a trade off. They say that I have that much resources available that you have only let us say m space using m space how much how fast I can answer a query. Now, I should say that depending on the application either query time is critical and you have to really answer a query uh, very quickly or sometimes the space is very critical, because if the data is too large, you cannot store spend more than linear size in the data structure. To just to give you some examples, for example, if I look at the network routing, so the question that comes is that uh, if I when a packet reaches at a node, where it where should be sent and this can be formulated a range searching query. Now, there it is very critical that the query should be answered very quickly in a few nanoseconds, right? because you want you do not want network delay. So, query time is very critical, do whatever space you need to do this sort of and there are some other challenges, I am just oversimplifying the problem, but and there the query is so critical that they cannot even rely on software. So, there is a dedicated hardware to answer these range queries there for networking, there are all these network switching circuits that they build to do that. Now, other extreme is you have gigantic databases, am I right? And um, there you cannot spend more than linear space because just storing the, all the data, it's a, uh, it takes so much space. Like uh, Google, or for example, a lot of NASA data set, which is in terabytes and petabytes of data. So the only thing you can do is linear space. So those are the two hard limits that we have, the extremes, and that's what people have sort of studied the, those questions. Okay, so with that introduction, now. Let me sort of say, to talk about two general techniques that are used in range searching. And all the most of the data structure that you will see, they fall in one of those two categories, sometimes maybe the both. Uh, so, a typical data structure for range searching, I think that is called, I will say it is called uh, one technique is you should think about as what is called semi group model. So, you are given a point set and the data structure if you remove all the technicalities, what it does is the following. It stores a family of subsets this is these are called canonical subsets.
okay. these are called canonical subsets such that well so far I have not said anything meaningful that uh, for any range r for any range you will represent the points that lie inside the query range as a, a union of these canonical subsets. So, f r which is a subset of f let us say c u. So, you represent the points that c i j empty for all c i c j in. So, all these things should be disjoint and union of c i is precisely So, what it means is that uh, you take a set of points, you do some kind of decomposition, it is not a partition, but choose some good sets, subsets. So, that for any query range, you can represent the points that lie inside the query range as a union of this canonical subset. This is, the, this is what I mean by canonical, because these are canonical subsets or anything I can represent as a part of this one. So, if you think about the group theory, this is kind of from the basis, if you want to think about this way. Now, so far again, I have not said anything meaningful in the sense, because you can store all possible subsets, right. Because you look at all, let us think about the rectangles. Rectangles are defined by four edges. So, then you can, you can, if you think a little bit about it, there are only n to power 4 different possible outputs. So, I can define n to power 4, because I did not say that anything you bound on m. So, you can represent all possible query outputs and say so these are my canonical subsets, then for any query range they will be precisely f r will be considered a single one, one of the canonical subsets. So, so far this is not very meaningful. What you want to do is you want to do in a such a way that both m and u should be as small as possible. That uh, what you want to guarantee is m is. So, So, let me make one more comment. If I store this canonical subsets, if m is a number of canonical subsets, then I need at least m, my size of data structure is at least m. It may be more, because how I store it, but if I am storing m canonical subsets, then I need the storage is at least m. So, the size is, is at least m and the qu query time q n will be max. So, you look at the query range and look at how many canonical subsets you need and if I can what I can do is that if I for each canonical subset I compute it. Uh, if I think in, the, in this abstract framework that I have written here, what I do is for every subset I compute its weight right and I store that weight. Okay. So, I store that weight then if I can find this uh, size in the set f r then I take those weights and I add them up, I return the query. Then the query's out time, the time of taking the query will depend, will be at least the size, will be basically the size of this uh, size f r. So, in the, if you are looking at the worst case query time, you question you ask is for any query, what is the number of canonical subsets that represent that query output. So, what you would like to do is since you want to keep both space and query time small, you like to keep both of these quantities as small as possible. So, basically minimize So, ideally what you like to do, you like to m to be as close to linear and keeping m to be close to m, then you like to f r to be very small, because remember the query time you want to be roughly log n. Then what you like to say is that for any query uh, f r, what you like to say is that m is roughly n and f r is roughly log n for all r in. So, this is a very strict requirement that you would like. For rectangles, we could achieve that. If you look at the range tree or KD tree data structures that you saw, both of them fall in this framework. And for the KD tree, m was precisely n, if you ignore the constant, and but 
the size of f r was root n because you have to visit root n nodes. So, it was root n, but by allowing m to be n log n, but allowing m to be n log n, you could reduce f r to log square n or log n depending on how you exactly do it. So, that is a game one has to play and question is how much you can succeed, how much you can squeeze. Now, of course, the number of things I did not say so far is that one challenge will be, okay, I know that I can represent a query output with a few canonical subsets, but how I find those canonical subsets quickly, that will be one issue. And also, how precisely I compute this canonical sets. And so, that those are the challenges. And when I talk with specific problems, you will see, but that is a general framework. And this framework is also very useful to prove lower bounds that you cannot do better than this. And that is what they show that, well, if I want to basically what they want to show is, even the lower bounds for orthogonal range searching, that is how they were proved. So, if you want to say that max is let us say order of log n, suppose if this is what you want to show, then what you show is that m has to be at least omega something. So, for example, if the ranges were triangles, then what you can, what people have shown is that if you want to get this wow, then m has to be at least n square. Or you can do other way, say that if m is n, then this implies that maximum something like this, the proof, and here it will be root n. So, that is how the lower bounds are proved. And typically, what people prove is that you prove, say, S n times T n, or sorry, Q n has to be at least some. So, what you say is that the space times a query time product has to be at least this much, and that is what people prove. But I will not talk, I will not prove the lower bounds in this class, uh, but uh, uh, I just wanted to tell you this framework because this is uh, lies underlies most of the stuff. And the second idea that is used in range searching is the following, what is called filtering search. This is meant for range reporting. Remember that if you are range, if you are reporting a point sets, and if you are going to report k points, if you know that the k is the output size, right. So, if you are going to report at k points, then you are going to spend at least k time, right. So, the query time is at least k. If I know that fact, if I am going to spend k time, might use that k time to help my search as well. So, I can spend additional because I do not care about constants for now in asymptotic analysis. So, if I know that I am going to report k points, then might I might spend another order of k time to do help my guide my search. Okay. So, then I can use then the query procedure and use k time to guide And this will be, you will see that this will be critical for many, uh, some of the data structures I will talk about. Any questions so far? Is this clear or? So, now that I have made uh, um, general remarks, I want to now go to a, a specific problem and I will sp start with a very simple problem is a half plane range reporting. First, I will talk about reporting and show you the filtering search then I will talk about half plane range counting. So, so now the problem is the following, this is specific uh, problem of range searching, you have a set of points, query is a line. 
and the line as I have said line divides a plane into two regions each of them is called a half plane let us say and I am interested in the half plane lying above the line. So, let us call this line L and this side of the line which lies above line let us call it L plus okay. and the question will be given the query line L report report all the points that lie above the line. Okay, all right. So that's what I will do first. So let's start with a simple case, and that will help us for the general stuff. Suppose S. So, first let us assume the case when points and s are in convex position. What I mean by if you look at the points, they form the vertices of a convex polygon. So, okay. So, let us say this is the these are the points that. Now, if I want have a query line L, I want to report all the points that lie above the line. So, how will you answer them and how much time will it take? So, how will you do it before you tell me the running time? So, how will you do it? Which point? Okay. So, you find this uh, let us say these intersection points, we just traverse the polygon am I right. So, what you do is first you find the, the let us say left intersection point and then you start following this boundary and you march along the boundary and report all these points. Okay. So, So, let us let us call this uh, uh, polygon as P. All right. Now, of course, there is a possibility that line may not intersect the polygon, am I right? That is also a possibility. Then what happens? Either all of them will lie on it, so then it is sort of that is a simpler case and we do not have to worry about Q. Then march from P to Q. No P and report and you said the time is as you said is log n plus k. Okay, so that's a, that was simple. Now what happens is the points do not lie inside the convex position, right? Then what will you do? Yeah, so
So, what you do is you first compute the convex hull. of these points. Okay. Now, among these points, I know how to answer the query, these points, I do it. So, for the, then I have to worry about the remaining points, but now basically I do the Ronian points and then I do the same thing. Let me add some more points. So, let us call these layers as uh, P 0, P 1, P 2, P 3. So, this is called onion peeling, because it is like peeling layers after layers and they are called convex layers. So, I think you had a problem either in the homework or the midterm about the maximal layers, am I right? So, that is these are different, these are convex layers. Okay. Now, you observe the following. I will worry, we will not talk, let us ignore for now how I compute these layers, how much time it takes to compute those layers. But suppose you computed those layers. Now, let us look at a line L. Now, how will you answer the query? So, in which, in, in, in which direction should you go? So, which layer you will look at the first? Look at. So, you look at the outermost layer first and use the previous procedure to report all the points, right. Then you go to the innermost, then you go to the next layer and so on. When do you stop? So, when the entire layer lies either above or below. Below, right. Because you know that if the if a, this layer, once you know the ith layer does not intersect the line, then none of this inner layers will intersect the line, right, because they are lies inside this convex polygon. So, that is why it is important you go from outside to inside. Okay. So, so, the data structure becomes compute convex layers, let us call them P0, P1, Pm of S. So, S i is let us say the set of points on P i. Okay. Then, query procedure is uh, i is equal to 0, we start from the outermost layer. while let us call this procedure as intersect P L. So, that the procedure that computes intersection points and let us assume that this inter this inter procedure either returns the intersection points or return it returns null. Okay. So, while P Q So, you compute the intersection points of a line with the layer. So, either if you return a point, then you do the while, otherwise you go and then you say report and let us call this procedure as report p q and p. P i. And y. Am I right? So that's what you do. Okay. Now first let's talk. So size of data structure is linear because each point is stored only in one layer. All right. So the size of the data structure, size is order of n. We'll talk about the pre-processing time later. So, what is the query time? Say it again. Why is order of log n plus k? 
Yeah, so but you are spending log n time for each layer. Log into the number of layers. Right? So suppose, so suppose let's look the following thing. For let's write it. Let's be little careful. Now suppose L intersects p zero up to p, let's say call p r, and does not intersect p r plus one. Okay. So it intersects r layers then so then it what happens is that you do the binary search r plus 1 times because the first time you detect it does not intersect you stop right so it will be r plus 1 times log n plus the number of points reported plus k okay now what is the bound you can give on r because uh, r is the number of layers but that is too much because then the query time becomes n log n. So, why is it k? Said. So, yes. So, if you look at the if a line intersects a layer, then at least one of the vertices of that polygon lies above the line. Am I right? So, what you know is that r is plus k. So, the quick the query time is k plus 1 times log n. Now, you would wonder why I wrote k plus 1 if I am using big O notation, why I wrote k plus 1 times log n, because k could be 0, am I right? So, then this expression becomes order of 0, which is not right, because you spend at least log n time, am I right? So, that is why I have, to, I have to write it k plus 1 times log n and this, this you have to be very careful uh, especially number of times, especially also when you do the base of a log when you are doing it. So, this you have to be careful with this one business, because sometimes if you are not careful with this plus 1, you can get wonderful results, which are not true. Okay. So, this is the query time. So, have you learned fractional cascading in this class? Have you heard? Yeah? Come on, either yes or no, like why are you quiet, everyone is quiet. Either you have heard or learned professional cases or you have not done it or you think that you are asleep in the class, you do not know what happens in the class. <laughs> Pardon? We talked about it once. Heard but not learned. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so let me continue with that tradition. <laughs> you hear it again but do not learn it. Uh, uh, so, if I have time at some point, I, I think it is a neat technique and I would like to do it, but uh, if I do that today, then I will not be able to finish it. So, so let me postpone it and I will try to do it. So, the fractional cascading technique, what it does is because you are spending log n time doing binary search at each layer. Now, what you would like to do is you like to do binary search only once in the outermost layer and maybe store some additional information, am I right? And then you spend only constant time. So, how many of you have heard about skip lists? Okay, most of you heard about skip list. So, ideas are kind of very similar. You should think about am I right? What does skip list let you do it? You basically you you propagate probabilistically or deterministically some of the points up and up and up, right? And that helps you to do the search. And the same I fractional cascade is very similar idea. What you do is you remove you you move some of the points from the inner layer promote them, keep them there, but also promote them up to the next layer. And similarly, a fraction of the points you promote them up and you keep on doing this promotion. And then when you do the binary search here, you can not only have done the binary search here, but implicitly you also got the binary search in for all the layers, because you can go in constant time from here to here and then from here to here in the constant time, which is what happens in a skip list. right? Because what you do is you do a binary kind of search and then you have the pointers to the next layer that help you go in the next layer. So, that is a basic idea in the skip list, but it requires more work and I will skip that uh, details. But uh, And if you use that uh, uh, fractional cascading, the time becomes log n plus k.
Now, let me go back to the go to the pre processing time. If I do naively, I compute the convex hull that takes n log n time. Suppose you have done the sorting, you sort the points once, then you can do it in linear time. So, let us say you spend linear after n log n pre processing, you can compute a convex hull linear time. You find the points that lie on the on the convex hull, you throw them out, compute the convex hull again and repeat it. But if you do it naively, you might be in the situation that the number of layers can be linear because the layers might be just triangles. All right. So, you spend linear time at each time it for each layer, but the number of layers is n. So, you query pre processing time the total time you spend is quadratic, but that is too much and there are data structures and you can find in your textbook that uh, you can maintain the convex hull under deletions in log square n time. So, you can delete set of points and update the convex hull in log square n time. So, what you can do is you can remove these points, find the convex hull, delete those points, and then now you have the convex hull of the remaining points and you spend log square n time in deleting a point and each point is deleted only once. So, the total time becomes n log square n. Okay. So, naively pre processing time is n square, you can bring it down to n log square n using dynamic convex hull, but that is a sort of is the procedure takes log square n because you allow to delete and insert both and you are allowed to delete any point, but here you are not inserting any point, we are deleting only deleting points and we are also deleting in very nice manner, we kind of peeling the onion layers. In that case by being more careful you can do delete up you can delete a point in log n time. So, that basically brings it down to n log n and again you heard it, but you did not learn it how you do it. So, so n square is, is sort of very simple I can do it, but you can do. Uh, okay. So, without sort of telling you how the p n is the p n is n log n. So, that basically is what you can hope for because query size is linear, query time you know you cannot do better than log n and k you have to spend to report k points. But this is a filtering search example of filtering search because you look at the r plus 1 log n basically I use the factor k to charge the time in doing the search. Am I right? Now, if I want to do counting, am I right? if I do not want to report, just want to count how many points lie inside the half plane, then this is nasty, am I right? because then I since I am not reporting the points, I do not have k to play with. Right? Then you would like to say I should be able to count the number of points in log n time, but then this procedure does not work because r could be k could be as large as n. But if the first term is still there, this term is still there, right? Because uh, okay, by fractional cascading you get rid of log factor, but you but you have to visit each layer, and the number of layers could be n. So you spend linear time. So this is the filtering search place because we I very heavily use the fact that I am going to report spend k time in reporting those points and I use that very strongly. Now, now what I want to do is I will start today and I will not finish it today is to talk about half plane range counting, what can you do with counting. And it turns out this is a, the first instance you will see that if you want to do counting when you cannot do this cheating or filtering search, then you cannot get an uh, you cannot answer a query in log n time using linear space. So, what uh, let me sort of tell you at outset what you will get for half plane range counting if you want q n to be log n then S n will be n square 
n if you want q n to be s n to be order of n then q n will become that actually the way I will describe it will be square root of log n you can get rid of the log factor but it will be square root of n. And what turns out that there is no hope of doing anything better you cannot do better than this. So, which is surprising. So, let, let me talk about this one the first one because this is a simple and I can finish it today and then the second one I will talk on tomorrow. Any questions? So, I will use duality which you have seen in the uh, earlier. So, if you have set a point and a line L, so P is let us say a b there are many forms of duality and I will just use what is convenient here and there are I think you might have seen a different one earlier, but I used this one uh, I, I do not remember when I was what I was talking about, but I did this one here. So, if you have such a thing then you can what you can do is you can map point p to a line p star. So, this is a primal plane. and this is the dual plane. So, p star becomes uh, ok. So, let me write it here. Uh, so, p is equal to a b that maps to a p star which is y is equal to a x plus b and a line that maps to point L star which is minus alpha beta. So, and what you sort of the picture that I have drawn to illustrate that in the primal plane if P lies above L then it is a dual line P star lies above the line L, L star. Now, if you play with the coefficients a little bit then you can do different ways of doing it, but this is the property I wanted to preserve that the, if the p lies above line l then p star lies above line l. So, if you have a set of points if I then I have asked the following question if I take the so half plane range so range uh, was report range searching was that you wanted to let us say report or count the number of points lying above the line am I right. So, now if I dualize it then what happens? So, you, you have a set of points let us say in the primal. Now, each of them you dualize that becomes a line am I right. Now, if you have a line L this becomes a point here in the primal plane. So, this is primal this is dual am I right. So, in the primal you wanted to report all the points that lie above the line. So, what does it mean in the dual? Yeah all the lines that lie above this this point L star. So, if you think about drawing the vertical ray report all the lines that intersect the vertical ray starting from L star am I right. So, here report all lines line right. Now, um, other thing you notice is that if you take two such rays, so the above, below. above am I right because you notice this the picture that P above a line L is the line that is above the of the point in the dual. Now, if you notice that if you take two such points and you look at the lines that lie above it the all these both of these vertical rays intersect the same set of lines right. So, if you have two points that lie in the same face here in this uh, arrangement then they intersect the same the vertical rays intersect the same set of lines. Now, if you want to do the count then what so what it means is that for each face here 
you store how many lines lie above it if I want to do the counting. Okay. So, now what you do? So, now can someone summarize the data structure? So, how will you answer what data structure will you construct? So, remember that we talked about arrangements, am I right? So, this is uh, what you do is, uh, is that you have a set of lines. So, let us say S star is a set of lines which are the dual to the points. So, what this is what I have drawn here is the arrangement of these lines, am I right? Which is a planar decomposition. So, so first is you do You compute the arrangement, then what do you do for the arrangement? So, what do you want to store for the arrangement based on what I told you? For each face, store the lines that lie above it, all right. For each face F. Let us say W of F is the number of lines okay. and then finally, what you do? The, how do you answer a query? What you now what you need to know is when I get a query line, look at the dual point and figure out which face it lies in. So, this you have seen what is it called? This data structure. So, yeah, someone said it point location query. So, now you have plane a graph preprocess it uh, planar subdivision preprocess for point location queries okay and the query procedure given l locate the face F L containing L is from a right, find the face that contains the report W F of L, report what you stored, the quantity that you stored there for that face. Okay. So, what is the query time? How much time the point location query take? Log n time, am I right? So, this is log n. What is the size of the arrangement? n square, am I right? So, this is arrangement is size, this is n size is now, well, this is a computing quantity for each face, there are n square faces, or this also takes only n square space. What is the size of the point location data structure? Pardon? Why order n? Order in when you say point location is order, what is n there? Number of what? How many faces are here? n square, n square right? So, it is a linear in the size of the uh, planar subdivision, and the, but the linear size is here quadratic. So, it is order of n square. So, you have quadratic size data structure and computing arrangement that you have seen takes n square time, am I right? So, this is size time, this takes n square time. And when a computing arrangement, you can maintain this also. I leave it for you to figure it this out. So, this takes n square time. What is the pre processing time for point location? Come on, I am running out of time. I need to finish it. So, if you have a planar subdivision of size n, how much time does it take? It is not clean. No, n log n, right? Why will it take n square? Why not n square log n? Yeah, so it's n square log n, am I right? So you can do sh sh get rid of the log factor by being more careful. But let me not get into that. Let me just stay with this modest form. So what you get? You get a data structure whose size is n square. Query time is log n, and preprocessor time is n square log n. Okay.